the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, welcome to the church, our church, St. John the Wonder Worker. Um, it's in the OCA, the Orthodox Church in America. It's the first church in the world named after this particular saint. And today we're talking about relics, and so he will be predominant in that talk about relics. We will be discussing a little bit about him so you get to know him as well. Um, how many of you saw uh, the movie, um, no, I can't even think of the name of the movie, the, the movie about uh, Marty McFly, Back to the Future. How many of you saw Back to the Future? Raise your hand. In that movie, in that movie, Marty McFly uses his DeLorean car that uh, his professor has made it, and uh, with his flux capacitor, has made it an ability to go back or forward in the future or into the past. Or as it, the movie's called, Back to the Future. So uh, he has to go back and into the 50s to make sure that his father kisses his mother because if, if his father doesn't kiss his mother, then um, he and the rest of his family are going to end up being duds. Not cool. Not exactly a good reason to go back, but it, when, it was a, when it was his, you know... You mean not reason. born? Hmm? They were not going to be born at all. Yeah, that's right. They weren't even going to be born at all because he had yeah. these little pictures of them and they More were fading. Well, anyway, he gets back and there's a lot going on in the movie. You can see it. It's a, it's a movie of our, my youth. And... Um, at one point, he ends up on stage, um, and he starts, he's, he's a musician, so he picks up a guitar, and he plays Johnny B. Good. Johnny B. Good wasn't written yet in the 50s. It was just being written by, I think it was by Bo Diddley, and so they get him on the phone, Bo Diddley, and he hears the song sung, and of course that's in the movie where he got the inspiration for the song. But anyway, he's playing the song. He's playing it in 50s style. He's singing it and playing it and all of that. And, um, but, and he's into the song and he's singing it and singing it and then he forgets himself. And he jumps to the 80s where he's a musician. In the 80s, the, the Who and lots of people like that were very big and they used to break their instruments and you know, play these old things and run all over the stage and act totally crazy. He forgets himself and starts doing that. So he's running that guitar up and down, sliding from side to side, banging his guitar on the uh, amplifier and all of that, and totally forgetting himself and playing the music that he's used to. And then suddenly he stops for a second, looks out, and all the people are standing there like this, you know, looking at him because they can't, absolutely cannot fathom what he, what he has just um, done. And he says, well, you may not like it, but your kids will love it. Now you say, why did I tell you that story? The topic that I have today that I'm going to be talking to you about. I've never met a kid that enjoyed this topic. <laughs> I like to start at the bottom and work my way up. <laughs> Just stick, stick with me, buddy. So what I'm saying is in relation to that, you may not enjoy this talk now. Not, I'm not going to say, but your kids will. <laughs> I'm going to say, but you will when you're in your 20s and in your 30s. Because what I'm going to talk about now is the presence of God. And that's how I relate it to relics. I'm not just going to talk about relics, the, the bones of the saints, but what is the philosophy behind it? And why would you even have them in your church at all? Why would they, why would be of interest at all? And so, when I talk about the presence of God, you have to talk, in order to have the presence of God, it entails sacrifice. You have to have something in your life that you're willing to give up in order to get the presence of God. And at your age, you're not always willing to do that. So you may not be willing to do it now. But if I can talk to you about it in such a way that it sounds interesting to you, I have a feeling that when you, as you age, get a little older, you'll remember this, and then it will have, I hope, great meaning for you. Are we up now? You see, that wasn't so bad. It only took five seconds. 
for you, but it might not be for them. But it might not be for them the whole talk. Like I, you know, I I I plan long term, so I figured this talk is going to last for five years, and at the end of the fifth year, not me talking, but at the end of the fifth year, you go, oh yeah, that's right, that's what it was saying. How interesting. So I'm not looking for anything now except a smile, and if you fall asleep, you know, not to act like you're asleep, so that, just to humor me. What we work for in the church in relation to Christ is the presence of God. <clears throat> Everything that I do is so that I will have the presence of God. Another way of saying the presence of God is to use the word grace. You've heard that word before. What it, how would you define grace? I'll define it and then you see if this is close to the way you define it. When you say, I have the grace of God, would that mean that you have a little something extra that's given to you that allows you to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do? Maybe just a little bit extra oomph. A little bit extra oomph to give an understanding. I don't know if you pray before you go to your classes so that you can do well in school, so that God will be with you in, in there. I don't know if you pray before you came here. I don't know if you pray when you do things. Uh, I don't know what you do or even think about to have the presence of God. But here's my question for you right now, in this moment, for all you teenagers. When you walk into a church, do you feel the presence of God? Or is that concept totally and utterly foreign to you? Is it a totally foreign, foreign thought for you, for me to say that? Oh, I never thought of it that way. I don't, because most teenagers that I have met, it's a totally foreign thought. You don't think about that. You don't think about the presence of God. You go to church, you go to church because your family brings you to church. You may even love going to church. You may love the Lord. Hopefully you do. You may love the life. You may love being Antioch. You may love being whatever that relates to God. But do you ever think about it in terms of a closeness of feeling to Him? Where you actually feel His presence in your life and know that He's with you. The first time that I did, speaking of rock concerts, I don't know why you would bring that up, but I like to keep it at about what well, we all can understand. Um, when I was your age, a little bit older, I had had some people teaching me about God and about Jesus. And um, they were, um, I was a young person. I owned a, I owned a young people store that sold clothing and records and all of that. And um, it was placed, it was kind of in the center of the town that I was from. And so therefore it was a very, it was kind of important to the kids of that time. And so we took advantage of that and organized a police and uh, youth rock concert for charity. For the first time that the police had ever done anything with kids with long hair. And, you know, in my, in the late 60s, that's what we looked like. And so, um, in the early 70s, and so we'd organized this, and we'd have, we were having it outdoors at the um, Municipal Opera in our city. The Municipal Opera. I mean, how often did they let you use something for a rock concert? Never. This was the first time. So the stage was there. We got about 10 bands from the surrounding area, no, no great big ones, but, and everything was set and it was pouring down rain 10 minutes before the concert started. The concert was due to go from 12 noon until 10 p.m. at night, that's all. It was a big, long thing, all day, all day event and all of that, and it looked like it was gonna be a bust. And, I, and I, since I was the organizer of it, um, I was totally befuddled because I knew we'd never get the opportunity again. It was just one of those windows that had opened up. And I, people have been teaching me about the Lord, but I'd never really done anything about it, just like I'm kind of talking to you, presenting you with this presence of God as a principle in, in our lives. I never really thought about it. I'd gone because I was interested. I even had kind of a love for God in my heart a little bit, but not overwhelming. And, but I had no choice. There was nothing else I could do but pray. And I never prayed before. I'd ta been taught how to pray, but I'd really never done it. Or at least never done it when I had to. You know what I'm saying? When you have, when you have a situation that you're absolutely um, 
there's nothing you can do about it except put it in God's hands and hope that he'll do something. I went and I walked up the side of the stage and I said, Lord, a very simple prayer. Lord, it's raining. I don't want to see this go. Um, you know, we pray in your name, Jesus, let this be done. Forgot about it. Ten minutes later, the skies were absolutely clear, blue. Until 10 o'clock at night. At 10 o'clock at night, the other side of the bad thing could have happened. In the first part of the day, the bad thing was it was pouring down rain and we wouldn't have had the concert. In the second part of the day, none of the kids that were there wanted to leave. They would just have stayed there and been rock, you know, raucous and, and started tearing the place up and then we would have had the other bad side of it, the bad side of the rain. This would be the bad side of the kids being lousy. They'd been there all day. You know, they didn't want to go home. They wanted the bands to keep playing and all of that. I didn't know what I was going to do. But um, lo and behold, at the end of that time, at 10 o'clock on the nose, it poured down rain. The rain came back. Everybody went home. It was the end of the concert, completely successful. We raised a lot of money. And I went off and followed the life of God. Because for two weeks after that, I didn't have any idea what happened at that point. You know, you pray, you forget about it, you have the thing, you're caught in the moment. But two weeks later, it hit me. Oh my God. I had just prayed. I prayed. And the Lord heard my, you know, and I said to myself, if, if I could say one prayer and that would happen, what happens if I live a life that way? Well, here it is today. We'll have to. We'll see how that goes. But anyway, I don't regret it. I never looked back for one second. But that was my moment of knowing that God was with me. But that wasn't even what I'm talking about then. That was seeing an effect from something that I said. But what I'm talking about is actually feeling that God is present in your life and that you know that he's with you. And when you do something that is not pleasing to God, you know it by one reason, because you feel the presence of God evaporate. It disappears. So you feel an upliftment. By the way, this is right out of the Bible. When St. Paul, for example, was going into, uh, into um, China, and he says, I was going into China, this is right in the scriptures, I believe in Acts, and he says, but we were unable to do so because the Spirit wouldn't let us. Now, how does he know that? How does the Spirit, some, some thing tell you, or a voice from heaven say, the Spirit does not want you to go, God does not want you to go into China? No, it's not like that. You feel it inside of yourself. You become sensitive. This is what the spiritual life is all about. It's not what you all are thinking about today. You have lots of things and hopes and all of that. And the presence of God in your life is not necessarily the first priority that you have. Do you know what? It is the first priority in my life. What can I do? This is straight out of St. Seraphim, by the way, the uh, Acquisition of the Holy Spirit. Have you read that, both of you? Yeah? Have you? No, you need to read that. It's just beautiful. He says, in Saint, have you ever heard of St. Seraphim or Seraph? That's his icon right over there. Pointing to it now. Yet, yeah, raise your hand if you have. No? Wow. Well, think of all the things you have to look forward to. Anyway, the, including the presence of God. Anyway, St. Seraphim said, do whatever you can to acquire the Holy Spirit and to have it be a part of your life. And be totally aware of what that means so that when you have done anything that would move it away from that, move in a different direction. Whenever I feel I'm talking, or talking in front of people, or acting, or talking to the poor, talking to the rich, uh, they, before someone who I have no answer in what to do when they're sick, whatever. And then you feel a presence of the Spirit of God in you. Does this sound weird to you? Raise your hand if you even heard this concept before. Just a few. See, that's what I'm talking about. See, I'm right. Kids your age do not even have this as a thought in your mind. I would ask you this question. I always ask this question because it's always amazing to me. 
Why do you even go to church? That is the reason I go to church. You say, well, I go to church to worship God and to tell God that I love him and, and be with my friends and family and all of that. That's not what it's about. That's nice that you do that, and I'm not, I'm not dissing it. I'm not putting it down. But the truth of the matter is, I go to church to, be, to commune with God. Commune. Be with him, to feel him, to know that he's with me, and to make him strong, ask him, not make him, ask him to be stronger in me, so that every day I feel him more, and more aware of him, and more aware of what he wants me to do, and hopefully, although this is really tough, do things that are pleasing to him. How do I know that they're pleasing to him? Just like I'm talking about. This isn't some kind of thing where I, I, I search the scriptures, although that helps. How do I know what I do in life is good? Okay, the, because the Bible tells me so, right? That's a start. But you know that it's good because you feel the Spirit with you when you're doing them. Now, my goal in a church as a pastor is this. That when you walk into this church, you feel uplifted and you feel the presence of God. There are certain things that you have to do to make that available. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. But what can I do to guarantee that at least you'll be exposed to the presence of God when you walk in this church? Well, one thing's for sure, not have rock concerts in it. In fact, don't have any talks in it that aren't prayerful. So up here, oh, this is a talk, but this is a talk about God, so this is okay. But generally, I don't have anything up here but prayer. And back to me. Got a Cleveland prayer, he's the vacuum, or actually, so is Ryan now. That's why I had him here, because I have prayer and vacuuming, and they, they, they're the vacuumers, so that's why they're here. <laughs> you see, you started at the bottom and you picked up in five seconds. <laughs> they were so worried. So what do I do as a pastor to ensure that there is the presence of God in a church, in this church, in this church? Well, since I'm not holy, the only thing I can do to guarantee that besides serving the liturgy, which is holy, praying, which is holy, and having a brotherhood of people that are warm, friendly, and loving in the church, that's absolute must. You want to have a church that's uplifting and you walk into it. You cannot have a cold church. People that are unfriendly and not warm when they see other people, don't like other people, aren't, aren't willing to have anyone but their own people, for example, in the church. And any foreigner, any strange person, any person that looks a little weird, and people look really weird today, don't they? I mean, you can really get some, not any of you, of course, I'm hardly <laughs> But, but in general, there are a lot of people. All those people are seeking God the same as you are. Well, I don't know if you are, but they're seeking God. So you want to have something. So you have warm, friendly people. You have prayer going on all the time. We try to have services all the time in this church. In fact, we have them every day. We have matins and vespers every single day. We have liturgy four times a week. And in the fast, we serve it every single day. A divine, uh, divine liturgy. Why? Not because we're good people or because we have a lot of zeal for the faith or any of that kind of stuff, but because I want the presence of God in the church. You have to build it up. It's not something that you call down and it's there and then it stays. For example, you see that icon over there of St. Nicholas? That icon has a presence of St. Nicholas about it. Why? It's 150 years old. It was smuggled out of Russia. If you look at it real closely, can you see the line in the middle of it? Some man, you know, because in the when commun in the communist era, they burned the icons of the churches. They tore down the churches. So um, some guy cut it in half, put it in a suitcase, and carried it and smuggled it out of the country. Gave it to an art dealer. I heard in town that there was an art dealer that had hundreds of old icons in Atlanta of all places. So I found out who he was and I went over to his house and visited him. Called him up and asked him if I could come see the icons. He said, sure. 
He wasn't orthodox. He said, I have these icons. You know, Father, I can't sell too many. I don't sell too many of them. I'm going to tell you why. These are ain't. He had 16th century icons. Old ones. Extremely valuable. And they were on every single wall of his house, of his apartment. Right in the middle of downtown. It was like being in a gold mine. He says, you know, I don't sell that many of them because it's a funny thing, Father. I just feel good when I'm around them. Well, anyway, I walk into his bedroom. There in his bedroom is this huge icon of St. Nicholas. Just on one of the side walls of the wall. The bedroom's dark. I'm looking at it there. It's just sitting there neglected. So about, I got to know him. And I, he'd let me come over every once in a while and just stand in front of the icons and pray myself. But he didn't want to take any time with it himself. You know what I mean? He just wanted to chat and offer me some tea and all that. So I said, do me one favor. I said, I'd like to come over one time and just show you something. I said, I'd like to, I'd like to bring an akathis that we have. That's a, you know, everybody know what an akathis is? It's a prayer service. I said, I have an akathis to, to St. Nicholas. I'd like to bring it over. It was this feast day or real close to it in December. I said, would you mind if I came over and just prayed it, prayed in front of it for a few minutes? I knew I couldn't do the whole thing. That would take 25 or 30 minutes. He wasn't interested in that. I said, just let me pray the first verses of it. So I went over there, I started it out, the icon to Saint, you know, the prayer to St. Nicholas. And he says, Wow, well, Father, I really felt something when that happened. Just for five minutes is all I prayed. So his feast day was coming up. St. Nicholas has two feast days. You know what the first one is? December 6th. You know what the second one is? Father? May 9th. When that the time for meandering in thought. The second one is when his relics, which were in um, one place, were moved to another because the Muslims were taking over and they were to destroy the relics. So that's the second feast day. Well, that was in the middle of May. And I said to, uh, I called my friend, and I said, listen, there's a, uh, there's a feast of St. Nicholas in May. Do you think I could borrow the icon for the weekend? And um, then, you know, when it's done, I, you know, just come get it and all of that. He says, absolutely. I said, I have the perfect spot for it. I had this, this shrine, and uh, we had had a fire in our church here in 1995. Everything was burned down. So I didn't have, but the, the shrine had been restored, but there wasn't anything to put in it. So I said, you know, I've got this perfect little place to fit in, and we'll put it in for the weekend, have the service to him. So we prayed all weekend with St. Nicholas and all of that, and then he comes back on Monday. And one of the, one of the uh, women in the church happened to be up here, and she says to him, she says, oh, thank you so much for lending us um, the icon. And he says, what do you think I am, an Indian giver? It's yours. $10,000 icon. Seriously. I mean, you can't even find an icon that big, that old, anywhere in the world. Except in some of the really old churches. And in Russia, a lot of them, most of the icons like that were burned. Not all of them, but a lot of them are they kept them for Anyway, so he gave it to us. Cold, huh? Well, it's cold to me. When you have an old icon, what's the point of this? When you have an old icon that you have prayed in front of for centuries, what happens is this. The way an icon is painted is it absorbs the prayer. It's painted with a, especially in a Russian icon like that, it's painted with a tempera. A tempera is a very, do you know what the word diaphanous means? Very light, translucent. You can see through it. You see into it. And of course, that's the spirit of an icon is. Anyway, isn't it? You look through the icon to the spirit behind it. You with me? Everybody asleep? You look through it to the spirit. What's the point of anything in a church? You walk into the church, you want to feel the spirit of Christ, right? So that you feel like you're feeling the presence of God. So that icon has been prayed in front of since 1850. All the sorrows that a person would pray and pour into it, they stay. All the love of God that is in it, it stays. That's the spirit of a really old icon. I mean, it's not that you can't pray in front of the new ones, you know, that are prints and all of that. That's perfectly fine. But when you have a really old icon, it has a presence about it from all the prayers that have been had around it. It just carries it with it. 
So one of the things you would want in your church is to be surrounded by icons that people have prayed in front of. Because then when you go up to that icon, what's going to happen? You're not feeling, you're feeling sleepy, you're yawning all the time, you can hardly stay awake, like, you know. And suddenly, you stand in front of that icon, you feel the presence of God, you go, what a, wow, I feel, I don't know, just like, just like my friend, the antique dealer, felt around the icons. I just feel good when I'm around it. That's what happens, that's a, a start to feeling the presence of God. You just feel good. You feel enriched. You feel a little bit better about life, about yourself. You feel a little more at peace with all the situations in your life. You feel a little more at peace, a little happier. Happiness is not what I'm talking about with the presence of God, but it is an after effect. Now, the things that saints have touched or what they were, the bones of the saints. You say, why would you want dead people's bones? What, what's the entrance of that? I mean, I, I would imagine you don't even think about it one way or the other when you think about relics. You probably went, the class, this class is in the ozone. It's a class on relics. Maybe I could see a few that might be interesting. Maybe I'd see my own saint, a piece of his bone. But outside of that, that's it. Why would you want to be around the relic of the saint? What is a saint? A person that is holy, isn't that correct? A person that has lived a life in which the whole church recognizes them as being a holy person, having presence about them. Uh, and St. John put it this way, my own saint, St. John, the saint that's over there. He said this, holiness is so much of the presence of God that it pours through you and enriches others. Now, we don't have any saints around us, but we have their bones. We have the things that they've touched. Who knows what the Midas touch is? You know from the story, the grim story? What's the Midas touch? Someone touches the head of someone, right? Or touches anything and then it turns to gold, right? You have the Midas touch? You ever heard that story? Well, anyway, that's true with the saints. They have the holy touch. I don't know how you'd say it. How would you say it? They have the ability to put gold on someone by touching them. It raises them up. It makes them awake. And things like that. Well, maybe not awake. But it enriches them. And they feel enriched when they're around them. This is not what you'll do now. You won't chase after these things. But I'm going to tell you what I do. I chase after them. If I hear of holiness, have you ever heard of the cursed root icon? 12th century icon, still around today. Yeah. There's a copy of it that was laid on top of it right over there. We had the cursed root icon in our church. I'd seen it 20 years ago. I walked into the uh, place in San Francisco where it was being venerated. There were so many people in the place, I couldn't get close to it. From 20 feet back, I walked into that church and I felt absolutely transfigured by the presence of that icon. It had so much holiness about it. Now see, these are terms that I'm talking about. This is what I want you to get. So that you, when you're in your 20s, will remember this and go, oh, that's what he was talking about. You don't just go to see an icon because it's, a, it's something of antiquity that was in our church that's very special to our church, that St. Seraphim, whom you don't even know, and other saints. St. Seraphim was healed in front of that icon. St. Seraphim is one of the greatest saints of the church. Why? Because he's like St. Nicholas, one of the most loving saints that there ever was. He's a very loving saint. Completely, um, but when he was a youth, he was dying. This icon passed, well, they were, it was in Russia at that time. It went past his home, he was healed as it went past his home. So we have St. Seraphim today because of that icon, and he's a saint. All right, so what, what I, I want to be near that icon myself. It touched a, a saint and healed a saint, but also it's healed countless people. It sat right there, and actually it was in my home because the, the person that brought it had to eat afterwards. So we had him over to Mass, and he put it on my shrine at the home. 
course, they were in there eating, and I was in the in there taking pictures of it, and uh, just being near them. Just you know, me and me and the icon. It's just like a human being. You talk about an icon like a human being, you call it she. I was with her for that long because the presence of the mother of God in that icon is so strong that you feel like she's right in the room with you. you talk about these people, right? You hear about them, you hear about Jesus, you hear about the mother of God. Do you all at least raise your hand if you know who your saint is? Because everybody knows your saint, right? Do you ever think one second about that saint? I want to know everything about my saint. I'm saying Jake, my saint is Jacob of the Old Testament. You know, he was the one that wrestled with the angel. Remember that? Jacob's ladder. Have you ever heard that expression? He saw a ladder moving up to heaven. He wrestled with an angel. Wrestled with a, Who wrestles with angels? You know, in the whole of the history of the church, from Adam to now, there's only one person that ever wrestled with an angel. That's my saint. God bless you. I say, what's that mean to me? If I'm named after that saint, does it mean that, what does it mean to me in terms of my relationship with angels? Anything at all? I think about these things. I think about my saint and know, want to know how I can be like that person. If, if he was so forthright that God sent an angel and he, the angel could not overcome him except by hitting the back of his leg, he wrestled all night with this angel and the angel did not beat him. He beat He tied the angel. It was a tie, the wrestling match that they had. What human being could do that? Tim Tebow, maybe, but I don't know anybody else. <laughs> Actually, he's going to be wrestling with an angel tomorrow, about, or tonight at about 8, 8, 8 o'clock. You don't get that, but for those of us who like football, we do. Have you been following him, though? Is that the, He's not that interesting to you, Tim Tebow? You have, raise your hand if you're interested in him. Okay, so three people are interested in him. Raise your hand if you really like him. <laughs> Here's a football player, folks. Talk about the presence of God. Here's a football player that does nice things for other people. I mean, seriously nice things. Kids and um, paraplegics and all these. He invites them to the games. Makes their life. They have these horrible people have horrible lives of suffering and sorrow. And he, you know, he does nice things for them. I hope that for you, that you can do nice things for people that way and make them feel good about life because of the good things you do for them. And they're so enriched by having been around you that the presence of God is left with them because of your goodness and your life. You ever think about that? All right, so relics. This robe, for example was worn by St. John Maximovich. You say, how oh, come on, how, how do you know that? Well, for one thing, he was five feet tall. Very short man. Okay, let's look at this robe and see just who could be in it. Now, Gregory's four foot nine. The end of there. So we'll take a look at, in relation to him. Oh, no, you're not four foot nine. Anyway, anyway, how tall is this robe? I'm six feet. Five feet tall? Oh, how many priests do you know that are five feet tall? Any? Huh? You have permission? <laughs> maybe, this, maybe this was Bishop Antoon's robe. <laughs> but I don't think so. He's taller than that. Anyway, this is a five foot tall robe. So there's a good indicator. How I got this robe was this. We were the first church in the world named after him. There was, uh, when St. Saint, Saint John was a really, um, you know, he was kind of a person that didn't follow convention. And he didn't care about what he wore, or what he dressed, and all of that, but everybody else did around him. So he, his robes were getting tattered. And so they wanted, to, um, they wanted him to get into some new robes. So they asked one of the nuns that was taking care of him, and she'd take the robe and burn it. And then, um, and then they bought him a new robe. He didn't, wasn't interested in that, but he wore, didn't wear shoes a lot of the time. He walked around barefoot, ragtag, holy, is so, so holy. And well, what I mean by holy, when I say that word, 
I mean that when you were around him, you felt the presence of God. That's what I'm talking about, about anything that I talk about in relation to holiness. I went into a church. I felt the presence of God. I met so-and-so. I felt the presence of God. I held the robe of St. John that a saint wore, this one, and I felt the presence of God. Well, you won't have any trouble doing that with this when you're 22. Right now, you probably will. Maybe not. Why do I say that? I tell you that I have wrapped this robe around countless people. As a matter of fact, the first person that I know that was healed with this robe was an Antioch. Uh-huh. I have a story about that. See, I've got all these stories. This should keep you awake, guys. Come on, snap it up. It's two in the afternoon. St. John, which robe we had, we had on a feast day, some of the Antiochian church came over. This was, this was 10 years ago. There was a young girl in the church who played the piano. She, loved, she was looking to be a concert pianist. She was 14. She was excellent at, at playing the piano. And um, she was in the church, and her mother brought her over for the service. But she had a problem. She had something like carpal tunnel. You know what that is? Where, you, where your wrist hurts in such a way as that you can't move it. It's, a lot of time you get it from uh, typing on the computer for a long period of time. But in her case, it was from playing the piano so much. Her wrist was so hurty that she couldn't play anymore. She was heartbroken, devastated. So she came over here, didn't know much about St. John at all, just like you guys. But she, you know, she went over and this, the rope was sitting out here like this, right over there. She put her wrist on it like so and went home that night. At 2 o'clock in the morning, this is by her words, not mine. She says she woke up, looked up, and there was St. John standing over her. He's been dead since 1966. She said that. She was, she could have been dreaming because the way that she said it was, oh, I looked up, I saw him, and I said, said oh, it's you. He walked over and touched her wrist. And then she fell back asleep. When she woke up in the morning, she went to the piano and played it for eight hours and could play it ever since then. Every time I see her, I'll go up to her and I'll go, here's the wrist that St. John touched. And I go, kiss that wrist. Because, now, what's that? Now, did, it, did you get the point that I said she was an Antiochian? So that we can relate a little bit here. I've worked with kids for years. They may not like it, but they'll remember it. <laughs> Seriously, I want you to remember this. Because someday in your faith, you're going to say, I know what he's talking about. I get it. When I sit with this rope right now, this very moment, as I'm sitting here and it's sitting against my heart just as I'm talking to you, suddenly I feel my heart changed. I feel St. John's presence. I tell you, when I wrap someone in this robe, okay, all right, how about you? When I do this with someone, okay, just like this, and they come into our church, and they don't have to be Orthodox, because St. John even prayed for Jews and Muslims. Actually, he healed, a, he healed a Jewish woman on Easter. How did he do that? He, was, he always visited hospitals. He was a very kind and good man. So he went into this hospital. That's all right, let her cry, so what? And he went into the hospital. He went into a room where there was a Jewish woman who was sick with cancer or something. When Christ is risen like that, the woman got up and she was healed of cancer. That's a robe that that man wore. I have so many healings that have taken place because people have prayed to our saint. St. John, I say our, I don't mean really like I own him or something, but... but um, that have prayed to him that I cannot tell you. That, that woman in the Antiochian church, that girl, she's a woman now, she's got two kids. But she was, back then, she was healed by him. Isn't that what we're talking about here when we talk about the saints and all of that? Are you just talking about some unknown relationship with people that you hardly ever see? 
and that you never, you never have any relationship with at all, but that you're named after? Or do you actually have a relationship with them? Do you feel them with you, walking with you? You're named after somebody. Who's named after what? St. Nicholas? Who's named after Nicholas? Here. Okay, here's who's named after. Give, give me your names. Who's your saints? Come on, down the line. Who? Daniel. Matthew. Theodore. Irene. Nicholas. Peter. James. Anna. Sarah. James. James, the <laughs> brother of the Lord. Rebecca. Anna. I knew Anna's. Rebecca. Jonah. Rebecca, the Old Testament Rebecca? Yeah, that's my wife's too. George. Jonah. Jonah, the of the whale? Well, that's a cool one. <laughs> They're all cool. But do you know them at all? Have they ever visited you? Do you ever feel their presence? On their feast day, do you know what the date of your... Raise your hand if you know the, the date that you honor your saint. Raise your hand. Oh. Of course. <laughs> Very few of you. Our faith is a living, absolute living faith. We interact with those invisible people. Do you know why we have all these icons painted all over the walls of a church? So that when you walk into it, it's a symbol of you being in the kingdom of heaven when you walk in. You look around and you can't see anything but saints. They're all over the place because that's actually the way it is invisibly. You walk into the room with all of the saints there with you. And so you're with them. You're praying. They're in heaven, you're here. No knowledge at all? Is there no relationship? How about with Jesus himself? Would you say that you have any knowledge of him whatsoever? Now, when you think about Jesus, do you think about him like, oh, he was a good man, or are we glad that he's our God, or this, and it's all external. When I talk about the Lord, I want to talk about him from in here. This is where he resides, isn't it? This is the only place I can know him. Or if I see him in your face, if I see him in you. But that's the only way that I can have a relationship with him. Remember where he said, two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them? Why do we have the bones of the saints in our church? Let's just juxtapose to that. Because they carry the presence of those saints with them. We have a lot of relics of saints in this church. I went all over the world to get them. I believe the only reason that we got them is because our saint, St. John, whose robe is on the young lady there, because St. John loved the saints and he brought them to us. That's the way I think about things because everything happens because of a relationship with the divine, God moving in our lives. I was in the bank on Friday. I wanted a stamp for our loaves and fishes program. We served the poor twice a day. Twice a day, Monday through Friday, right out here in the, in the courtyard. We give them a hot meal twice a day, Monday through Friday, every day, especially Martin Luther King Day. When's that? Amen. Thank you. Good. Now, you know, son, you knew about Martin Luther King, you don't know about your own saints. But anyway, I did say it's good to know about Martin Luther King. Anyway, I needed a stamp because I'm writing out, when I get checks and donations to the... Um, Lowe's and Fishes program, I have to write on the back for deposit only and then put the thing, that's a pain. I'm lazy. I wanted a stamp. One month ago, I went to the bank and tried to get a stamp. The lady says, oh, you'll have it in two or three days, come over and get it. Never arrived. One month later, through all of the Christmas time, when people give the most, I had to handwrite all these things out. So I went over to the bank this last Friday. The lady that was supposed to be helping me wasn't there. And some other guy was there. He says, oh, let me try it. Let me try this with you. In order to get in to talk to the people who are, um, who are going to send me the stamp, he has to put in a password, which is automatically generated every time. It's just a word. Words come up each time. I'm sitting there with him. You know what the word that came up was? Divine. He looks at that and he goes, I've never seen that word before. I'm going... I'm going to get that stamp. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So he calls up and gets the, gets the people. They say, oh, it'll happen in three days. I said, look, do me a favor. Go in the back room and see if it's there. The lady said it was there and she couldn't find it. Or it wasn't there. She said it never arrived. It goes in the back room. I knew it was going to come. Two stamps came. He said they'd done it twice. Okay. Both of them had arrived and both of them come to my... So I get both stamps. Now, what do you say about something like that? If you're sitting there and spaced out and not really thinking about God, you don't even notice it. But if God is on your mind all the time, I'm not saying he's on my mind all the time, but at least he was a little there. If God is on your mind, then you begin to notice that he's actually working in your life. And as you begin to notice that he's working in your life, you begin to feel his presence. And as you begin to feel his presence growing you, you begin to recognize when he's with you. And you also begin to recognize when he's not. So therefore, if I'm talking with you and I start saying something that's rude or irrelevant or something, and I suddenly feel that there's a lack of loss in my life, I, I, I don't just keep talking to hear the sound of my own voice. I stop and I say, what's going on, God? Do you not always say that? Or did I say the wrong thing? Or do I need to change it or what? And then I listen, and hopefully by some stroke of the spirit, I'll see something's right or move it in a different direction or something. As long as it's working and things are growing and you feel the spirit, well, you keep doing what you're doing. But when it stops growing and you feel that, you change, your, you change what you're doing and you do something else. Now, the reason that we have those bones in the church, we have a large number of them. I'll bring out some boxes and just show you, show you some of these. The reason that we have them is very simple. Because I want as much of the presence of holiness in our church as possible. So that when you walk into it, you, you, you that I may never see again, I want you to remember that you were here, not because of what I said, or because of anything that was done, but because you felt the presence of God, and you felt the peace and presence of that, and you took it with you. And it's like the Midas touch. You touch the presence of God, it goes on to you, then you go to the next person, and you touch them, and it goes on to them, they touch the next person, and it goes on to them, and so on and so on, and pretty soon everyone is feeling the presence of God. One good action spreads for all exponentially, so that it's all over everywhere. Now there's the row. Here's something else that's interesting. You know who St. Peter was? Didn't somebody say they were named after St. Peter? You. Do you remember when he was in the Acts? When he was in prison? Remember when Peter was put into prison? You know anything about him? Yeah, good. He was put into prison. He was put into chains. Remember? Yeah. This is one of those chains that St. Peter was put into because the interesting thing about the chains is that at midnight, St. Peter was awakened by an angel who touched the chains and they fell off of him. He miraculously walked out of the church and walked to where everyone was praying for him, knocked on the door, and there was some young girl there who opened the door and uh, or was standing at the door and wouldn't believe that it was Peter, so she wouldn't let him in. And so finally they got somebody else and he was let in. You say, I, and I'm going to tell you how I thought about this because I'm sure you would if you even thought about it, would think about this the same way. Come on. That could be a piece of chain from anywhere. Well, how we got it is this. In 19, 1880, 1896, there was a World's Fair in Chicago. And at that World's Fair... Um, there was a church near the fair called the Chains of St. Peter Catholic Church. The uh, Rome sent over six links of the chain for the World's Fair so that people would have it, people would go and visit there. Over the years, the Catholics began to devalue their relics. They didn't think much of them. And a priest that I knew asked that some people that had possession of those links at that time for three of the links of chains. I when I heard that he had three links of the chain, asked for one of them, and this is it. Now, I got it, but I still said to myself, come on, it's a nice, nice thought, Symbol symbolically we can venerate it. Some friends of ours in the church in the 80s went over to Rome and brought back a book from Rome 
that had pictures of all the different pieces of antiquity related to the church. I opened the book to one of the pages, and that was the picture I saw in it. If you look at those links of chain, I already had this link of chain, never seen a picture of anything. I looked at the length of chain, links of chains in there, and you'll see it's exactly the same. The chain looks exactly the same. I said, oh my God, this is actually one of the links of chain. So here's the chain. So I touch this young man. Where's Peter? So Peter touches the chains that were on his saint, okay? Now, touch that. Hold that. So, what's the symbol of that? How does this work? 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, the apostles were walking upon the face of the earth. It was after the time that the Lord was in heaven. 2,000 years ago, Peter was in chains. That chain throughout all of antiquity to the present day was in Rome where Peter was, was imprisoned and let out. They kept those chains. Somehow they came over to America. Somehow they got to this church. And one day, Peter was in this church and touched the length of the chains that was touched to St. Peter. Linking him, linking, get that? Linking him to St. Peter, his saint. Is that just symbolic? Is that just interesting? Or is there actually a spiritual tie there? Is there something real about that that's beyond just me yapping? I say that it's much more than that. Now he's totally linked to his saint because he's touched his saint spiritually. Because his saint touched that. And let's take it a step further. Didn't some, who said Archangel Gabriel? Weren't there two in a row? <laughs> Who knows which of the angels appeared? It's usually Gabriel that does this kind of work. So, let me have the chain back. So he, you know, there's no, of course, there's never a relic of an angel. How could there be? They're, they're not, they're bodies. But, let's just say for the sake of argument that Saint Gabriel was the saint who stood before Peter and told him to get up and leave in that church. Now you two have touched the relic, and you are linked to your saint. And if it isn't the Archangel Gabriel, it's one of the other saints who stand with him in heaven. So now you've touched your saint, and he's touched you. Anybody else named after an angel? Raphael? Well, here. This is the way you think about these things. When you see a relic or a bone of a saint, I want the presence from that saint in my life. Who's your favorite saint? Give me a favorite saint. Have you ever think about that? Who's your favorite? Saint George. Okay. Who else? Your favorite saint? Yes. Saint Nicholas. Hesitantly, she raises her hand. When I'm talking about my saints, my hand goes up like this. Who's my favorite saint? Saint John or Saint Seraphim. These, these, these beings who walked upon the face of the earth get me excited. They were stupendous people of the kind of caliber of people that you just can't believe. They were so close to God and so loving of humanity. They were the richest of the people that ever walked upon the face of the earth. The richest, by far. So I get excited about it. You will someday too, when you're 22. Five years from now. Are you 17 now? 16? 14? How old? 14, okay. Well, let's, let's make it 10 years. Okay? 24 or about in there. When you are that age, and your eyes perk up, you'll remember this talk and you'll go, that's what he was talking about when he was talking about the presence of God and getting excited about the saints. Because now I feel like I want to be close to them. I want to be with them all the time. Right, Gregory? You want to be with them all the time. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's why actually he's here. I'm just teasing him about the other stuff. Same with Ryan. Ryan's getting married in five, five months. 
or less. All right, now let me show you how I display these, the saints. Just sit right there. I, I put them in boxes. Like this. They're all in this. I always keep them in there because I like to be close to them. I don't leave them out here, but I bring them out on the feast days. You see how I do it? See the little, the little icon? I put a little icon and then you put the bone with it. What is the bone? It's something that was a part of that human being. But those human beings were holy. This is a, this is a box of holiness that I'm holding in my hands. Let's see who's in it. I'm trying to find a saint that you guys would, would know immediately. How about the Apostle Andrew? Some of these are not saints that you'd be... Saint uh, Pantalaemon, you know who he is? He's a big saint in the Antiochian church. You know who he is, the healer? Constantine and Helen. Anybody here named Constantine? Anyway, this is how we display them. So you bring them out. Why are you laughing? Well, it was. It's a funny one. Share. Share. Yes. What? Sounds hilarious, but unfortunately, we don't have all day. In fact, we don't have any more time because your own your own priest wants to give a talk for five the five minutes that are left. All right, so let me ask you this: I've showed you the relics. I've told you about the presence of God. I've been enthusiastic. It hasn't totally worn off on you, sort of a little bit. But as I said, I wasn't looking for results today, and your I'm looking for results in 10 years. I'll be a little older, not much, but you'll be a lot older. And you'll walk into a church and you'll walk to the icon here and you'll say, oh, it's saying so-and-so. It's theophany. There's the icon of the Lord. And you'll take something in of the presence. You'll walk around your church and you'll feel the presence of God as you venerate the icons and as you look around and feel things. And if you happen to see a relic or something of holiness, you go over to it and you'll absorb it. Take it into yourself and you'll feel uplifted by it. And you'll walk out of the church after you've had communion, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And you will feel enriched to such a degree that you will then go do something nice for someone else. Or say a kind word. Or do a nice act, invisible. No one will know it. Because you won't care. You won't be looking for recognition. You'll just be doing something nice. Because the goodness of your heart is overflowing with the love of God. And you'll want to share that with others. Okay. The end. Now, should I take a few questions? I doubt they'll have anybody. Anybody got a question? No. Come on, think of a question, somebody. Why do you stay? See, that's why I, when you pick that topic, the only, I've only taught this class once before. I've taught the themes of it a lot. My class on relics, it was for, um, in Canada. I was going to Canada. Gabe was here before he was ordained, pre-ordained pre Gabe. And um, I, taped a, I taped a talk on relics for Canada and took it up to Canada so that they, the talk I gave on relics, they could all see what our church looked like, and I could give a show and tell. And, um, but they were, you know, the people up there were 30 and 40s, in their 30s and 40s, and a few younger. You know, this, it's a lot to take in and think about, but I really hope that you will, as you get older, remember this. And then you'll say, yeah. Now, any of you that would like, we'll just thank you for all the questions. They were really rich and wonderful. An old person giving a question. 
Why is it important for icons to be blessed? When you get a new icon, or you have icons in your home, is it important and why is it important? The priest prays over the icon, tries to make that connection to it being alive. It's like, the again, the Midas touch. He calls down the Holy Spirit, blesses it with these particular blessings and with holy water. And the icon has a sanctity to it. It becomes a window then that it isn't before that. So it, it changes it. Things are changed by blessing. You know, when you bless, do you have your houses blessed with holy water? Why? Just so that they can be cleaner? Why do you have them blessed? Why bother? Because the holy water sanctifies the house. It makes it holier. And in any negativity that you have in the house is washed away. I blessed our church that way too, just to make sure that there wasn't anything, you know, getting the holy water around. All right, so that's it for our class. <laughs>